I rather like the word that uh, Dave, that Dave used in his talk, a renaissance, and I think what we're facing now, globally, is a kind of renaissance. It won't just mean that we've got to think of new scientific inventions, of new ways of <clears throat> uh, doing business, of new ways of creating cultural forms, of new forms of social innovation. We've actually got to think very deeply about who we want to be and how we want to live. Now, when we're thinking about that, standards of living, of course, across the globe have risen very substantially in the last 20, 20 years or so. But so have social inequality and social injustice. And London shows that pattern very well. So the long-term prosperity of the future isn't just about wealth or growth in the economy or GDP. It's going to be about all the things we're going to hear about in a minute or two from other speakers about flourishing, about well-being, about the health of society and social relationships, about having educated, satisfied and healthy citizens who make decisions about the kinds of lives they lead and maintain, and about the kind of environments they want to enhance and the spaces and places in which they want to live. So sustainable prosperity is, for me, the major challenge of our age and we need to pull our intellectual resources and our imaginative resources together in order that there is something for the generations to come. And this project, we imagine London as a national park, is part of that kind of endeavour. Now when we're thinking about these projects in the Institute for Global Prosperity, we think about them as complex problems that force everybody to work across boundaries. So they force all of us in the university to come together, whether we're in cognitive science, anthropology, sociology, engineering, architecture. All these problems require us to work outside our comfort zones and across different kinds of categories and ways of thinking and understanding the world. But projects like the ones we're engaged in also require us to work collectively with people like you, with ordinary citizens in London. So reimagining London as a national park is only going to work if the citizens of London are prepared to reimagine their lives and to think of themselves not just as living in this newly imagined national park, but to think of themselves as researchers and as designers of the future of the city that they will live in and that their children will live in. Now London is a great city, designed mostly in the 18th and 19th century, bombed heavily during the war, reconstructed, some of it we're standing in, after the end of the Second World War. And the question is, is it now fit for purpose for the 21st century? How would we know whether a city was fit for purpose for what will come in the 21st century? But when we ask questions about something, when we say, is it fit for purpose, we're asking a question, of course, about values. And here we're asking very basic questions about values because we're asking questions about how to revalue commonplace aspects of our lives as well as the environments in which they're situated. And as we heard from Dave, London is a great space to start all that kind of thinking because there is already so much going on. There is already so much to build on. So, for example, we can look to a number of cities around the world. And when I did that before I came to talk to you this morning, I was thinking about, supposing we stop thinking about a park as an area of outstanding natural beauty, which is one of the definitions of a national park. But supposing we think about, can we create in this new park new forms of beauty, of enjoyment and leisure? And one of the ideas I particularly like from, country, from cities around the world is the idea that we should create out of this park in the city something called an edible landscape. So can we eat the park? Right? Now all of our great parks, of course, have magnificent trees in them, but how many of them are fruit trees? And I, looking out of my flat, I happen to be next to a small park which has two cherry trees inside it. And that means that in the early spring, you see this wonderful thing of commuters running along the street, taking a running jump at a cherry like that, trying to grab it on their way so they don't stop on the way to work, but they hope that they might get one and take it for lunch. I think in these kinds of ways of thinking of the landscape, ideas from other cities have come up talking about continuous, productive landscapes. 
And that notion of a continuous productive landscape is how do we fit in new ways of making the landscape productive alongside all the ways in which the landscape is already productive. That's alongside all the kinds of business, transport, uh, financial institutions, cultural institutions and so on that, would ha that already exist in London. So if we're going to be, rethink the everyday, how would we rethink the everyday? Well, in a national park, what would a street do? The streets of London are famous, many of them, and there are lots and lots of them. They wind all the way through the city, they mark the city out. Transport is the lifeblood of the city. No one wants any more traffic jams. So what do we do with our streets? Now, at the moment, what we do with them is make lots and lots of cycle lanes all over them which is great if you're a cyclist, and slightly less great if you're a pedestrian. But supposing we thought about our streets and said, OK, well, so could certain big roads be thought of a bit like the Thames as thoroughfares, or perhaps as urban agricultural fields, or partial fields? So what would happen if streets became fields? Now, the New Economics Foundation has done a bit of work on this, as they have on so many things of value to us in the capital. They've worked out that actually producing our food within London, more even than we currently do, would be a very good idea. Because every £10 spent with a local food initiative in the UK is worth £25 to the local area, to the local economy, as opposed to only £14 when the same amount is spent in a local supermarket. Now, Reducing the amount of energy used to produce and distribute food would, of course, have an effect on carbon emissions. But if we think about growing our own food and giving over different kinds of spaces to growing food, making our landscape edible, perhaps we would also be redistributing wealth a little bit within the city, enhancing family food security and quality, particularly for the poorest families. And perhaps we would also be closing waste cycles more effectively. And those things would probably be more significant than the impact on carbon emission itself. So rethinking the ordinary and the everyday is part of this imaginative way of engaging with what alternative forms of prosperity could be for the city. So what's a house going to be in a national park? Most national parks have building regulations which prevent you from building houses. So what's your house going to be doing? Could we make more of our rooftops edible? Could you lease out your rooftop for food or for energy production if you were old and make a bit of money on the side? Indeed, what is the whole notion of property going to be in a national park? When we look around what's happening in, in the big cities of the world at the moment, and particularly in London, we see that people are becoming much more interested in services than they were in the past, rather than possessions. So there's a lot of talk, of course, of shared office resources, of desks, of shops even, of shared innovation labs, of shared recreational spaces. All of that's already happening in London. But so too is renting a room to visitors who are tourists here. Sh sharing pets is very popular, apparently. Sharing cars. <clears throat> even renting camping spaces in your gardens to people who want to come and stay in London and can't afford hotel prices, and doing things like sharing expensive tools so that not everybody needs to own a hedge cutter. So lots of forms of sharing change the way in which we can think about how we manage prosperous relations with others. But also, what is work going to be in this national park? Of course, the city is a great city, there's work for many but there isn't work for all. Household income and wealth are essential components of individual well-being. They allow people to satisfy their basic needs and to pursue the goals that are important to them in life. At the current moment in the capital, we have a lot of in-work poverty. We have food banks. We have families who have ostensibly two adults working who can't afford to feed their children to the end of the month. And yet we live in a society which still takes the view that work is more valuable if it is paid, and the more it is paid, the more valuable it is. And if the more valuable it is, the more worthy it is of people's time and people's commitment. But suppose in a national park we started to rethink what work might mean. <coughs> suppose we thought that the value of some forms of work 
should be assessed and paid in terms of their creation of social and environmental value and in terms of their medium and long-term impacts on society and on the environment, then this would begin, perhaps, to begin to create the kinds of sustainable jobs that you would need to maintain, perhaps, the park itself. Now, we know <coughs> that London is home to many small and medium-sized businesses, as well as to lots of sole traders. So will they flourish in a national park? Well, perhaps they will, because if we're living in a national park and we're growing much more of our food and we're managing more complex interactions between agricultural fields and transport systems, if we're doing all of the things that we think we need to do in a park, value work differently, work differently, then maybe we will have many more agricultural supply stores or many more sellers of foodstuffs or many more hardware shops for tools or perhaps more flower production, more beekeeping, more hiking and bicycle shops. Who knows? Now we know that having access to green spaces has no positive health benefits. As it turns out, Londoners are already a pretty fit bunch, because if you take their well-being in terms of miles of walking per person per year, they walk 292 as compared to the rest of the UK, which walks 184, and they have much smaller numbers of car miles per person per year. But green spaces are not just places of natural beauty, things that we go into, but that we can enjoy because they enhance well-being in the ways that we all know about. But they can be further reimagined in the National Park as perhaps classrooms, or as they already are, as performance spaces for theatre and music as part of perhaps an ecosystem laboratories or even parts of care homes for the elderly. <coughs> Let me say that then, that in conclusion, that what we need with the National Park is not just um, a chain, but we need social innovation. London is a very wealthy city, but it needs to be yet more prosperous. And so my request to all of you is help imagine how this could be possible. Please sign up to be a London citizen, researcher and designer and scientist and apply your intellectual resources to the task because they're very much needed. Thank you.